All right, welcome in everybody. Thank you guys for coming out to today. Uh, my name is Jaron Halfpap. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Queen's Historical Society. And today we have a wonderful program that we're very excited to bring uh, to you today. Um, and I'm actually joined by the Queen's Historical Society's uh, director, Bronca Ducknick. Um, and so if you want to say hi, Bronca. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, today's program. We're so lucky to have um, Vishnu Sridhar join us uh, for today's talk. Uh, just a quick intro. Um, he um, is a local, I guess Jaren will say more about this, but I guess we've managed to meet Vishnu, uh, Vishnu through um, serendipity, essentially. Um, uh, there was a well-known Gothamist article, and through the reporter, Sidney Pereira, uh, we managed to get in touch with Vishnu, and he was so lovely in accepting our offer to uh, join today's program and share his experiences, um, trials and tribulations of the Mars rover uh, SerperCam engineering uh, project. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass it on to Jaren and Vishnu to continue today's program. All right. Thank you. So Queen's Historical Society is all about uh, preserving Queen's uh, history and culture, and this is part of Queen's contemporary history, uh, putting, helping put a uh, device on Mars. Uh, Vishnu is a JPL engineer from Queen's whose work um, was on the SuperCam, which I'm sure Vishnu will uh, talk a little bit more about um, and what he does at uh, JPL. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to have Vishnu say hi. All right. In. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited for this talk and I'm looking forward to it. Okay. So uh, you have a, a quick presentation for us first, uh, Vishnu. So if you want to get started with that, feel free. All right. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. So today um, I'm going to talk about Mars and then the Mars rover itself. Um, like Jared and Branka mentioned, I'm a payload systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I've been working at JPL for the last almost six years. So today um, I'm gonna talk about why Mars, the previous missions to Mars, um, and the Perseverance rover herself, um, what I do at JPL, and then open it up to some questions. All right, so let's talk about why Mars. So Mars is very similar to Earth. Um, Mars is about half the size of Earth, and we see a lot of similarities in terms of the structure of Mars and um, the way the different uh, terrains are in Mars, and that resembles um, Earth very likely. And also we have seen evidence that there has been past um, like water uh, flow on Mars. So that basically entails that there could have been life on Mars and we have compelling evidence um, to go look for on Mars to um, study those. So why we're sending a Mars rover? Um, we're sending a rover because we want to be on the surface of Mars and study Mars from the surface level so that we can see things from a cl close microscopic scale to from a larger scope of a macroscopic scale to see um, how Mars has evolved and um, uh, what's what happened to Mars in the past. And ultimately answer the question, of has there ever been life on Mars? Um, was there life outside Earth? So we're trying to understand and answer the fundamental question. So to understand Mars and uh, the possibilities of life um, evolving on Mars, um, we need to study uh, some key subjects. So that's um, geology, astrobiology. We need to collect samples. Um, so one day we can bring that samples back to Earth so scientists um, here on Earth can study them and of course, preparing for future explorers and humans going to Mars. So, so all these key points um, are necessary to understand and study Mars. So let's talk about geology. So geology is basically the study of rocks and soils. And we studied um, rocks and so uh, soils at different scales. So at microscopic scales through a magnifying glass to macroscopic scales, like taking images from an orbiter and studying a mountain or such and see um, um, what that tells us. 
so that's basically the study of ge the geology. And then the next is astrobiology. So the, the, we need astrobiology because that's a key component that connects geology and biology. And in this case, we're studying Mars. So there's the, uh, the space part of that. So hence the astrobiology. And astrobiology is a key component because that's basically the study we are going to um, uh, pursue to understand that there was a uh, life harboring on Mars at some point. And, and then we can study the so soils and the organic material that can give us the hint that there was some biosignature or um, some composition on Mars that could entail that there has been um, life in that region in the past. So that's the study of astrobiology. And then eventually we want to collect samples. So with the Mars rover Perseverance, um, we have the new capability of collecting samples, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, but th this is one of the main goals of the mission is to collect samples, put it in a test tube so that a future rover can collect that sample and bring it back to Earth. Um, so again, the future scientists can study them. And mainly because the rovers we sent are technically advanced, but they still are not as complex as the labs that we have on Earth. So we would like to bring the samples back to Earth so that we can use our advanced um, laboratories and equipments to study those samples and unlock the secrets of Mars so we can understand that, that a bit more. And then of course, ultimately as humans, we're explorers and we want to explore Mars. Um, so we want to send um, humans to Mars and bring them back safely. To, and to do that, we need to um, accomplish some technology demonstration. And with Perseverance Rover, we have a series of technology that basically demonstrates and proves that we can have humans land on Mars and survive safely. And one of the way we're going to um, do that with the Mars rover is to through one of our instruments called MOXIE. And that's basically an oxygen generator um, that we have on the Perseverance rover that uses the Martian atmosphere um, to collect the CO2 and convert that into oxygen that future explorers can breathe. So it's a really cool piece of technology that we're planning to demonstrate um, in the coming month or so. So Mars is, like I mentioned, about half the size of Earth, and it's very similar to Earth um, in terms of Mars has mountains, it has an atmosphere, there's wind on Mars, there's dust storms, and it's very similar. If you go to Grand Canyon or Mars, you couldn't tell where you are because it's very similar. And, and also Mars is very rich in terms of its geology and where you are on Mars. So back in 2018, scientists from around the world um, gathered here in Pasadena, California, and basically um, had a discussion, arguments, and things like that to determine where we want to go on Mars, where we need to send the Perseverance rover. And after a week-long discussion and talk between scientists, um, the scientists decided that we are going to the Jezero Crater on Mars. So Jezero Crater is close to the equator on Mars, but it's a very ancient area. And by that, I mean it's, um, Jezero Crater, uh, it's an ancient river delta. And basically it, it has um, features, a sign showing that there used to be a lot of water flowing in that region. And as most of us know, um, if there's water, that means there used to be, it's flourishing for life. Um, so after billions of years, though the water stopped flowing in that region and become arid, um, we still think that there could be hints of um, organic material, a compound or things um, that used to, um, give us hints that there was life in that region. So that's where we're hoping to study at the Jezero Crater. So Jezero Crater has rocks and minerals that could only form in water. So basically we're going to use that um, to uh, use our instruments on board Perseverance to check for signs of habitability and past signs. So through that Perseverance is basically um, going to explore this um, ancient river Delta on Mars. Which, can, which has rocks that are up to 3.6 billion years old. And we're going to drill those rocks. We're going to fire lasers on them. And we're gonna collect those samples and put it in less little test tubes that future rover is gonna go collect them and bring it back. So Jezero Crater is a very interesting and an ancient area on Mars that Perseverance has already begun to study. So really looking forward to that. And with all the instruments that we are on board, um, scientists are going to look for biosignatures, like I mentioned. So biosignatures are basically objects and substances or any material 
um, that basically can only be produced from a life-based um, processes. So um, we're ho hoping to find something like that. It's gonna be groundbreaking at Jezero Crater um, through the life um, perseverance. So that's, that's the uh, motivation. So that's why um, we're going to Mars. So now we'll talk about the previous missions that went to Mars and then focus on Perseverance rover and the engineering side of that. So a lot of people are interested in. So JPL has been going to Mars and NASA has been exploring Mars since the 60s. Um, the Mariner 4 mission, the satellite that JPL sent um, to Mars that took initial images of Mars. Um, before that, we were only looking at Mars through telescope. Um, we didn't know much about Mars other than it's a red planet. Um, it has an atmosphere and it's about half the size of Earth and things like that. And later on, um, we started sending rovers to Mars. So that's when we really started driving around the surface of Mars and exploring it, taking images. And it was basically like a human walking around Mars with like small tools. So it all started in 2003 with the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity which was about like a small golf sized, a golf cart sized uh, rover, which had basic instruments like a, like a small rock abrasion tool and a spectrometer and cameras. And it was a solar powered rover, but which we basically used to demonstrate and show that we can operate a rover on a surface and collect data and send that back to Earth. And Spirit and Opportunity was great at that. And Opportunity, in fact, um, operated on the surface of Mars for almost 15 years while the original mission uh, goal was only three months or 90 sols on Mars. And then later, uh, what we learned from Spirit and Opportunity, we sent the big, uh, much larger rover, like a small SUV sized rover, Curiosity, um, back in 2011 and 12. Um, Curiosity is more like a science laboratory on Mars. Um, she has a lot of instruments. Um, it was powered a different way, it wasn't solar powered rover. And it has a lot more spectrometers. It had laser um, instruments and it had high definition cameras and things like that. And then from all that technology and the data that Curiosity collected, we learned from that. And now we're sending the, we sent the Perseverance rover. So like I mentioned in 2018, the scientists chose um, the landing site where we want to land on Mars um, Perseverance rover. And then soon after that, around that period, when we were designing and building the spacecraft, the rover at JPL. And that was about a two, three year period. We have international collaborators in the European Union, in, uh, so in Spain, Norway, France, et cetera. And they all provided different instruments and different components for the Perseverance rover. So it's a very internationally collaborative mission. And also JPL, um, used its previous experiences um, for entry, descent, landing, the different uh, components we learned from the Mars Exploration Rovers and the Curiosity mission. So we have the Mars 2020 team, which I'm the part of. We designed and built the rover um, from around 2018 timeframe to launch um, in 2020. So in 2020, we launched Perseverance and it took about six to seven months to get to Mars and we landed safely um, in Feb on February 18th, a couple months ago. And with that, the launch in July on July 30th, 30th and landing in February 18th, Perseverance mission uh, began and it's right now as we speak, exploring Mars. So let's talk about Perseverance specifically. So it's very similar to the Curiosity rover, um, looks and feels the same, but it's equipped with a lot of new technologies, um, a lot of new instruments and next generation software. So the goal of Perseverance, um, unlike Curiosity, is to look for um, potential life or biosignatures that could hint previous life and collect those samples and store it in a test tube so that future rover can collect that and bring it back. So that's the main goal of Perseverance. But Perseverance um, being a JPL mission, we're really um, into taking images and looking at what we are, um, because Although we can collect so much data and we can collect spectra and fire lasers, it's nothing like you can actually see a picture's worth thousand words. So Perseverance has 23 cameras. So the SuperCam instrument has a microscopic camera that can basically, um, it's a telescope, so it can zoom into things that are really far away and take high definition um, images. We have the MassCam-Z, which is basically this HD 
uh, multi-spectral camera um, that we can take video and high definition images with. We have navigation cameras that um, show us like where the rover is driving so it can create 3D meshes so that it can understand the terrain it's driving on so, so we don't bump into a rocket or anything like that when we drive. We have cameras on the arm of the rover and we have cameras on the belly of the rover front and back so that um, we can see close up what the terrain looks like. So a lot of cameras on the rover to make sure that we get a lot of good situational awareness. And of course, the star of the um, Perseverance, it's uh, the seven instruments that we have, which, um, which comes from the rover's payload. So we have the SuperCam instrument, MassCam-Z, um, META, which is the weather station on Mars. We have two spectrometers on the arm. Um, Sherlock and Pixel. We have Moxie that I talked about, um, the oxygen generating instrument. We have RIMFAX um, that can uh, beam radar into the surface. Um, so looking into the instrument specifically, so like I mentioned, we have the SuperCam instrument. So that fires powerful lasers, um, which I'll talk about later as I work on this instrument specifically. Um, can fire lasers on rock anywhere between three feet away to 20 feet away so that we can see the elemental composition of the rocks. We have um, similar to SuperCam, we have Sherlock and Pixel. Um, these are all um, acronyms, by the, by the way, JPO is really big on acronyms. So anything we build, we try to make it into an acronym. So um, we have Sherlock and Pixel. They can study um, close up to a fingernail sized um, part of a rock so we can get up close and look at what the rock is doing. It has like different um, spectroscopy techniques that can um, basically tell us that the rock or the thing we're looking at has organic materials. So that it's very compelling um, for that to be then collected as a sample. And then we have um, the room fax instrument, which is sitting in the back of the rover and it fires um, uh, radio uh, radar waves into the surface of the Mars um, so that we can see what's beneath the surface um, several feet down. So although the rock bed um, looks like a certain rock, um, we don't know um, what's beneath that. So we're hoping to learn what's beneath the Martian surface with room facts. And we have our own weather station of Mars. So like we talked about, it, Mars has uh, atmosphere, Mars has dust storm, so we would like to know how that's evolving day to day and what the climate um, is on Mars. So we have the meta weather sensors that basically act as a little weather station on Mars. And um, of course, we have the MOXIE that I mentioned a couple of times. Um, this is going to be like, like the really, really important um, instrument and a piece of technology that we're going to demonstrate. And it basically um, sucks in the CO2 that we have on Mars and uses the onboard technology to convert that to O2 so that um, we can use that same technology in a larger scale so that future astronauts can breathe um, on Mars so that we don't have to carry all the oxygen from Earth. And we have other um, couple cool little instruments um, like SuperCam has a microphone and we have another microphone on the side of the rover, part of the entry, descent and landing microphone. So SuperCam microphone has scientific aspects to that. Um, it can basically, when we fire lasers on Mars, um, we can hear to the zapping sound of the laser. And from that, we can determine what the composition is. Like if you take a rock that's hollow, if you knock on it, it produces a different sound compared to like a solid rock. So we can infer things like that from the SuperCam microphone. And of course, this is the first microphone on the surface of Mars. So we actually got to hear how Mars sounds like. And um, with, um, with the future um, activities we have coming up, we have a lot of plans for the microphone, recording mode, both microphones in stereo so that we can get like a real world feeling for how it would be to stand on Mars. So we have lots of, um, lots of plans for these two microphones. And um, the next key technology on the Perseverance rover is the sample caching system, so SCS. Um, like I mentioned, collecting samples is the main goal of this mission. So the sample caching uh, system is a very complex, um, a new technology that um, the engineering team created. Um, it has like arms and little test tubes, and it has a lot of complex technology within it so that we can collect the sample that Perseverance looks at and thinks it's a compelling sample for um, organic materials or any um, life hinting uh, material. So we basically collect that 
and we have to seal it in a certain way so that it doesn't get contaminated. So when we, when another rover picks it up and brings it back to Earth, we want to make sure that the sample stays clean and safe so that if when we do bring it back, um, we do know that it's not something um, like a bacteria or something that came from Earth and it's something truly we found on Earth. So it's a lot of care and um, engineering went into the sample caching system. And then the last um, key technology on the rover, of course, another star of the show is the helicopter. So JPL always likes to te demonstrate technology with all the new missions. So this goes back to the Pathfinder mission in the late 90s. Um, we sent a little microwave sized rover called the Sojourner um, that was basically a small solar powered rover that was the size of a microwave we sent to Mars just to demonstrate that we can operate a rover on Mars. So back in the late 90s, when engineers sent that little rover, they probably didn't imagine, or probably they did, um, that we're going to be sending a whole SUV sized rover in like the next decade or two, and we did. And we're in sort of the similar situation now, we're sending this small um, solar powered sized helicopter to Mars. And the, the goal of that is essentially to drop the helicopter and demonstrate that we can fly a rotor powered aircraft on another planet. And that's going to open way to a new whole world of exploration and how we explore Mars. So now instead of just driving around, we're going to fly an helicopter around, take images, and we're just going to get a whole new perspective of how we're gonna fly and explore Mars. So at this phase of the mission, we are about to drop the helicopter soon. Um, this, this animation shows what the plan is in the upcoming week. So we're going to drop the helicopter. We're going to test the blade to ensure that it spins as expected and everything is nominal. And then we're going to um, fly the helicopter for the first time. And for that first flight, we're going to record using the microphone we have on board. And we're going to use the um, mass cam instrument to videotape the first, <clears throat> first flight so we can actually um, experience what the what the, um, how the helicopter is flying for the first time. So it's gonna be very exciting the next week or two. So the helicopter is currently sitting on the bottom of the rover. So that's the uh, perfect spot for the helicopter so that um, when, we, when we land, the, the helicopter ingenuity is safely sitting at the belly of the rover like a kangaroo. And we're going to drop it off um, in the next day or so. Um, and then she's gonna start her flight. So as you can see, the Perseverance rover has a lot of piece of hardware and a lot of piece of technology that's going to help us take humans to Mars safely. It's going to help us um, understand some key scientific questions like was there life on Mars? Um, we're going to demonstrate new technologies like flying the helicopter and things like that. So given that it has a lot of technology and it's a very complex piece of hardware, all of that operates in 110 watts of electricity. And that's one of the key challenges um, the rover has to, and the, and the engineering team has to accomplish is because we need to operate all the different pieces of hardware, but with a really low uh, energy cost. So if you take like a powerful light bulb from your home, that's how much power it takes the Perseverance to operate. So it's really exciting and cra um, crazy to think about. And unlike the previous rovers, we don't use solar panels. Um, we're using the um, radioactive decay on the back of the rover. So as the, as the plutonium degrades, um, it creates heat and that heat um, charges the battery and that powers all our instruments and things like that. So we can operate the instruments for decades um, to come um, and the dust storm or things like that won't affect the rover operations. So it's very exciting. So that's Perseverance Rover. So I can talk a little bit about what I have been doing at, on the Mars 2020 team. So I've been working on the SuperCam instrument for the last three years. And SuperCam instrument is, it's a very unique instrument. It has three components. So it has the mast unit, which sits on the top of the rover um, with all the optical and the laser components. We have the body of the instrument, which sits in the belly of the rover. It has a software and spectrometers and things like that. Then we have calibration target on the back of the rover. And that calibration target is basically used so that we can fire lasers onto that target so that we know um, how we can compare the results we collect from firing at the Mars rocks 
compared to the rocks we take from Earth. So we can do sort of a comparison in the Martian atmosphere. So the, the instrument fires lasers on rocks. We call it Lib Spectra, which is um, which basically fires a red laser on the rock and then the initial plasma that comes out of the rock. So when the laser hits the rock, it vaporizes a little bit and the light being collected into the instrument and into the spectrometers can tell us the, what the compositions are and what the mineralogy or the elemental composition is. And we also have um, like the instrument has a color camera so that we can get up close and look at what the structure of the rock is from the outside layer and um, what the grain size is and things like that. So we can actually take high definition telescopic images um, using SuperCam. And of course, like I mentioned, um, has a microphone so that the initial laser sound can be uh, interpolated and we can study um, what the rock um, structural composition is from the sounds we get from zapping. So SuperCam is a very interesting instrument. Um, it can it does a lot of things. It does a suite of things. Um, so it can analyze rocks that are large to small, that are near to far away, so that we can, again, aid in understanding the fundamental question and helping collect that sample um, with ease. So I have been working on SuperCam as the lead instrument engineer. So that means that um, I was um, in charge of any anomaly resolution, um, integration of the instrument with the Perseverance rover. So I was in the clean room at JPL um, integrating the rover um, when the tech technicians installed the rover, make sure that all the components were installed properly. We put the whole SuperCam instrument and the Perseverance rover in like a giant thermal chamber so that uh, we can basically uh, mimic the Martian atmosphere so that we can know all the um, components are working as expected. Um, we do verification validation with the instrument software compared to the rover software. So make sure that they all talk to each other properly. So, um, so that all happened um, in the last three years um, when we we're building and designing the instrument. So once that's done, we launched the instrument, uh, the Perseverance rover in July, 2019. And on, while Perseverance is going to Mars, um, I was in charge of doing a lot of testing. Um, so commanding the spacecraft and the instrument on its way to on during cruise on the way to Mars to make sure that it survived launch and things like that. And we repeat the same thing once uh, Perseverance had landed. So over the last month, um, I've been sending commands to the Perseverance rover and um, SuperCam instrument to ensure that the um, landing into Jezero Crater was safe and the instrument survived that. And we've been getting beautiful data and images and everything has been excellent so far. Okay, so with that and the landing and Perseverance um, surface mission has started and we've already been getting exciting data um, from Mars and I would like to share some of the pictures with you guys. So this is an image we got like a week after landing um, at Jezero Crater um, taken by the MassCam Z um, instrument looking at the back of the rover. So you could see that um, there's a lot of wires, a lot of components um, sitting outside exposed. Um, one lucky thing is that it doesn't rain on Mars, so we can just leave things like this exposed and we don't have to worry about um, uh, humidity or weather in that sense. Um, and um, you could see that um, we have like different antennas here. Um, this little um, giant cylindrical thing is the, um, UHF antenna, which is the ultra high frequency antenna, and that's used to communicate with the orbiters um, around Mars so that we can send data from Perseverance to the orbiter, and then the orbiter will send data back to Earth. And then we have um, a lot of different small things like a sundial, which basically we can take an image of and see where, which direction the sun is and things like that. And this next uh, chart shows us this little wheel turn test we did. Um, so this is again, like the week of the landing. Um, after we landed, we checked out our actuators. So series of motion on the wheels to make sure that the wheels and the actuators are performing as expected. And they were all nominal. And we also did like a drive um, recently. So the mobility system is working in an excellent shape. And then next is the Ingenuity, um, which is sitting on the belly of the Perseverance rover. Um, as you could see here, that um, Perseverance, like a kangaroo, was tucked in um, into that position. And, and recently, in the last week, um, if you have been following the JPL press release, um, we're actually deploying the helicopter. So there's like a little 
a series of pyrotechnic devices that fire and releases the locks so that um, Ingenuity can safely deploy onto the Martian surface. And so this is, image shows that um, Ingenuity right now is in the deployed um, position. So the legs are down and basically waiting for the pyros to fire so that Ingenuity can be dropped, the rover can drive backwards, and then we can start our first flight. And then uh, we checked out our arm. So the, the rover has uh, six degrees of freedom um, arm mounted in the front of the rover um, and the turret, um, which has multiple instruments and drill and things like that. So we are checking out the different motions again on the first week of landing. So that's basically the brief intro into why Mars and the Mars rover herself. Um, hope you all got to learn something and enjoyed it. So can open it up to some questions. Okay. Thank you, Vishnu, for that very informative presentation. Um, if you want to end your uh, screen share, then we can have everybody pop back on screen. There we go. Okay. So as we transition into uh, our Q&A section, I encourage all of our viewers to um, leave any questions that they might have in the uh, comment section of the video. You might have to scroll down a little bit to find it, um, but you can just type your questions in and we'll be able to read them. Um, in the meantime, I believe Branka has a question for Vishnu. Yes, Vishnu, I think congratulations are in order not only for successfully landing I, it was no small feat of humanity, I have to say that. And then congratulations on successful, uh, great uh, dat data gatoring. I'm so, I'm so glad that, you know, the data has been, uh, you know, successfully kind of streaming back to Earth, to your lab. And then the mobility of the actual rover, as you're speaking about it, it seems so easy, but this is something epic that um, all of you have worked on and all these systems together are just truly, truly exceptional. Um, and we'll go down in history, hopefully also Queen's history through you. Um, but here's my question. There's many, many questions right now that are you know, brewing, uh, but um, I would like to see if you can take us through sort of a, a typical day at the lab. Um, you mentioned to us before this program that there are various shifts, there are 24 hour shifts that the staff has to deal with. And then um, you've also shared a photo of you and your crew uh, in hazmat suits. If you can explain why you're wearing them, you know, just a very basic question for people who are, you know, non-engineering uh, um, professionals. Uh, just, you know, take us through your typical day, your typical shift. Yeah, so so pre-COVID period, um, so JPO is a very collaborative environment. Um, if you walk into the campus or the lab, it feels like you're in a university. You see like people sitting outside in shorts and working um, by a coffee table and drinking Starbucks. And so it's it's very much like a like a university or a college environment. Um, but also like JPL values um, knowledge sharing well and being inclusive. So um, as a young engineer myself, um, I've gotten a lot of responsibilities um, being the lead system engineer for SuperCam and doing various testing and having that effort. Um, so although there's a lot of checks and balances, um, young engineers like myself get a lot of good exposure and learning from the world-class experts at JPL. So that's been a really exciting journey. And, and even every year JPL, um, pre-pandemic, we had this thing called like an open house um, or explore JPL where where we invite like tens and thousands of people into the lab and basically talk, we have different booths that we talk about um, like Mars or Jupiter or Saturn or any planet we go to or having current missions going on. So talk to kids and students and um, parents about it. So it's been very exciting. And to touch base on um, specifically Mars 2020 and the hazmat suit that you mentioned. So the Mars mission, um, we take planetary protection very seriously. And by what that means is um, we have a team at JPL called Planetary Protection and Contamination Control. And what that means is that um, given that the, uh, the Mars mission right now um, is specifically um, geared towards finding life and geared towards um, looking for organic materials, we really want to be careful and safe about um, what we find and how we um, how we portray that information. 
And because of that, we need to be ultra careful and um, be sure that we don't take anything from Earth. So what we do with all our um, instruments while building it and testing it, we wear these suits and we minimize um, any exposure um, from us, like a hair falling or saliva or anything that gets on the rover so that in future we don't drop it on Mars and aren't sure that whether is this something we took from us or is this something we truly found on Mars. So. So that's why um, even pre-COVID, we were wearing masks on lab and complete suits to make sure that we clean, we stay clean and tidy while working with the flight hardware. So you're used to it. You're used to masks and everything way before yeah. the pandemic started. So absolutely, um, yeah. But thank you for this. And one last question I had: um, Do we know the scheduled official scheduled date of the first flight of the helicopter? Is that something that is kind of pinned down or not yet? Um, so it, it's it's actually um, it's not pinned down. It 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 depends on various things. Um, so um, we want to make sure that we did all the correct series of tests um, before we fly the helicopter. Mm -hmm. So we are charging the batteries to the right percentage um, because once um, the Ingenuity helicopter gets detached from Perseverance, um, the charge will be no longer coming from the rover's battery. It will be coming from the solar panel. So we want to ensure that um, that's okay. Uh, we need to ensure that the internal helicopter hardware is um, working as expected. So right now, that's what we're doing. We're doing a series of activities, and we're making sure that even the site we chose um, for the, we call it the airfield, so it's going to be the fly zone. Uh, we mapped out where we want to fly to make sure that um, the area is good. Um, there's no like dust devils or new storm brewing up or anything like that. So we're using our weather station on Perseverance to monitor the um, weather and things like that. So. Hopefully in, in this month, we'll do our first flight and we're going to hear it all over the news. Okay. That is That's so funny. wonderful. <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask a, a, a couple of questions about what it was like for you uh, growing up in Queens. Um, were there any particular places uh, or spaces that really helped that foster your love of uh, learning and STEM and engineering? Yeah, um, definitely. Like, um, like growing up in New York, um, my high school friends and I like spend a lot of time in Barnes and Noble. <laughs> we just go out there and hang out, definitely. And also, um, like the um, like the Rocket Park um, that we have um, by the Queens Museum and and the the Science Hall and all of that area is really exciting. Um, spend a lot of time there, and definitely the Rocket Park. Um, is something I have vividly in my in my memory because of the Saturn V. It's one of my favorite rockets, yes. the most powerful rocket ever built. So I have a lot of fun biking around there and looking at that stuff. So NYSI is a staple of science museums uh, and uh, science museum education. What was your relationship with it? And do you hope to see yourself one, there, uh, one day being a, a part of it or uh, having left your mark there? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's definitely the um, it's definitely the um, the key center in Queens and New York City that talks about um, different space missions and the scientific studies and how us as a humanity has propelled and and really looking forward to contributing something to that in the future. And and I'm sure that um, we're going to have exhibits with Mars Rover and Ingenuity and even the future humans landing on Mars. Um, so it's, it's going to be a very hot place. So uh, outside of the scientific aspect of it, uh, where around Queens do you uh, remember enjoying, relaxing, hanging out, or recharging at? Yeah, I mean, so another place that I spend a lot of time with with friends is the Queens Mall. <laughs> Yeah. So the Queens Mall, um, yeah, by the Woodhaven uh, subway stop, we hang out there. Lots of good food, um, just a good time, a good place. And of course, um, the parks that we have. So you mentioned uh, going to aviation high school. Uh, I know that's certainly not a very typical high school. Uh, so what was your experience uh, going there? And was it difficult to explain what aviation high school was to other people? Um, absolutely. I mean, so I think going to aviation high school is probably one of the best decisions I've made. Um, actually found out about the high school when I was taking the seven train um, 
saw that there was a giant building and it was written in front of an aviation high school. And growing up, I was a huge um, airplane fan of airplanes. Like um, I used to like look at an airplane and name what the model is and things like that. And knowing that that was a high school dedicated to aviation and aerospace, um, I was very intrigued and was fortunate to go to that school. And I had no idea what we learned in that school going in. So freshman year, we got exposed to like basic principles of fluid dynamics. And we were taught how a gas turbine engine works. Um, soon later, sophomore, junior year, we were doing sheet metal work. We were doing welding. So it was a really wild experience. It was, um, you got to work with actual aircraft. So lots of hands-on technical experience. Um, that was very valuable in my future career, I would say. Yeah, there's an aircraft in the building that students take apart and put together, correct? Yes, we have multiple aircrafts. Ah, <laughs> it was you exciting. would never know looking at it from uh, the 7 train. That's true. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I don't think that, to be honest, other countries have the high school's so, you know, geared towards specifically air and space or aviation. So I have to say we're we're feeling a little blessed being in Queens and, and New York in general. And, you know, kids can learn um, basically just by taking the seven train that there is a, an aviation high school. You don't have to live in that specific area of Long Island City. So it is truly an amazing uh, thing to know. Um, I wanted to sort of touch base on a few things you might share with us. I was kind of interested in um, basically sharing any sources, any books on um, successful or unsuccessful attempts and experiments uh, to land on Mars, any vehicle on Mars, and basically which general books and articles would you be able to recommend on the topic of um, Mars vehicle engineering or just landing like mars landing rover landing in general and uh we'll be sure to copy paste that information into the chat or even later on on our website that would be super super uh valuable to all of us yeah um de definitely so speaking of mars rovers i think the i think the best or one of the um, best books i've ever read um was written by my boss's boss rob manning and it's the curiosity rover um, from like basically an insight of a chief engineer and um, how um, he experienced the project and the end to end things he saw about the the life of the rover from initial design phase to landing. And that book is really good because it talks about um, like the different challenges um, we had going into the phase A. So NASA missions typically have different phases. So phase A through E. And A is when the scientists propose the instrument, uh, propose the mission where they want to go and what they want to do. And then phase E is basically when we land and started operating it. So Rob Manning in that book basically talks about different challenges we had through the design reviews, um, personnel conflicts. There's always everywhere, um, like um, between scientists and engineers determining um, and scientists want to do certain things, but engineering challenges, it's complicated. We can't really achieve it. And, um, and then also things like achievements. So when we do have a uh, technologist working, we test it and it's successful, um, how rewarding it is, things like that. So it's an excellent book that talks from a first-hand experience that I highly recommend. Very great, good. Um, on a personal level, uh, with this mission to Mars, what are you hoping to explore? And uh, what kind of questions do you personally want to see answered? Yeah, so I mean, so I'm an engineer, I'm not a scientist, although I am very curious and intrigued that whether we're going to find biosignatures or not at Jezero Crater. But me personally, um, what I'm excited about, most of them are already happened, um, which is collecting initial data from the SuperCam instrument, making sure it's working, um, taking images, microphone, audio, getting the engineering data from surface of Mars. So I have been getting that for the last month and it's been very exciting analyzing all that data. Um, and of course, um, I'm very looking forward to the Ingenuity flight. Um, that's going to be a huge paradigm shift in how we explore Mars, and it's going to be a pretty epic uh, technology demonstration. And of course, I'm looking forward to um, MOXIE also producing oxygen um, upcoming soon so that you know, our astronauts can go there with confidence. 
So uh, what were you doing on landing day? Uh, were you at Mission Control or were you watching at home uh, with the rest of us? Both. So I was um, in Mission Control um, virtually. So I was actually working. Um, I was the payload downlink uh, coordinator for the landing SOL, so SOL Zero. And what that means is that I was in charge of all the seven instruments and making sure that the initial telemetry indicates that the instruments are at a safe position when we landed. So I was analyzing the data at touchdown when the data was trickling down. And of course, um, I was um, with folks um, watching the landing like everyone else using uh, via the national live stream. So it was definitely nerve wracking, but also exciting. So uh, when you got to see the, the actual video of the landing, was it uh, like watching it all over again, uh, just as exciting? Yeah, so when we first got the EDL camera data, so we have the we have this thing called L cam, which is the lookup cam, um, and then we have the uh, parachute cam also that looks into the parachutes. Uh, when that data came down, like the next day, uh, a couple saw later, uh, the team put processed it and made videos. I was just like mind blown. It was surreal because um, that's the first time um, we're actually testing that piece of parachute um, and the cruise the descent stage because we can't test it on Earth. So to see all that happening synchronously, um, it's very exciting. Um, are you hoping for another opportunity-like situation where the rover has an unexpectedly long life on Mars? Absolutely. So I, I think that so JPL... Um, being having done Mars rover design and working on the engineering team, even though the mission proposal is that the rover's prime mission is one year, that's the case for Perseverance, the team still designed and engineered the rover so that it can operate as, as long as it could. So Curiosity rover, again, one year life mission, but it's operating right now for over 10 years now. So I am hoping uh, Perseverance is going to do the same and outlast Curiosity and all the previous rovers. Um, what is people's biggest misconception about these rovers? Uh, I know personally at first I thought, oh, they're about this big. And then I find out, oh, they're SUV sized. <laughs> yeah. So size is for definitely, um, a key point. Um, the, uh, the Perseverance rover is about like a golf, uh, sorry, a SUV sized rover. So it's quite big. Um, if you stand next to the rover, um, the super, where the super camp sits, um, it's, you're probably quite lower than that because um, it sits about seven feet high. Um, but the most um, interest, funny questions I've gotten was most people think that we joystick the rover similar to the way we do with an RC car, like a remote control car or like a UAV or something like that. But commanding perseverance or curiosity takes several tens of hours of planning with a group of engineers. So we call that the uplink team. And by that, I mean is every day, um, every SOL, one day on Mars, um, a group of engineers come and sit down along with scientists and we look at where we are and we pick a target. And then the engineers basically write sequences and commands and package that into a file that gets radiated or sent to Perseverance. And then when Perseverance wakes up, um, she ex basically autonomously executes those series of activities and then send the data back to Earth. And then at night, engineers analyze it and then just repeat that process. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of initial planning, waiting around and seeing how it went and then before doing the next planning. So we don't really do any real-time commanding of perseverance. Well, definitely, I really hope all the teams are getting along really well <laughs> because there's so much juggling and so much teamwork. Uh, that everybody needs to be in sync with uh, with the team members of different departments. Um, that's super exciting to know. We're looking forward to reading the books um, on your supervisor to supervisor book, uh, which we'll place on our website as well. And um, here's a little question sort of um, that I was curious about as you were talking about naming the rovers, uh, you know, how can you kind of walk us through who who's naming them. And then the second question within this question is, uh, Jezero Crater has been mentioned, obviously, as a landing site many, many times. Um, is it true that it was named after um, a small Bosnian town? Jezero, essentially, is the pronunciation. I don't know if that's correct, because even the uh, the um, 
the people living in the town couldn't believe that it was named after it. So they thought it was okay. false news. Uh, but just walk us through just basics of naming the rovers and then again, uh, the name of the creator. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I actually did not know that Jezero was pronounced Jezero and it's it's from that town you mentioned. Um, but that's very interesting um, to know. Like, I had no idea about that. Um, but the Perseverance Rover uh, naming competition, um, JPL has been doing this uh, for a long time and NASA has been doing this for quite a bit. Um, but we basically put out a like a essay question and um, for students um, from middle school, elementary, high school to basically write essays um, with with a name they choose and why, why they want the rover to be named that particular name they choose. And I think I was actually sitting, um, I think it was early 2019 um, or late 2019 when we are having like a bunch of um, names that were selected that like the top 10 names. And then early 2020, we're all sitting in the JPL auditorium when the uh, name was chosen and it was Perseverance. And I had actually read, uh, read that um, uh, essay from that student um, before and it's like the perfect name we can choose because it shows how we persevered through um, the pandemic. We launched a spacecraft, we landed on Mars all through a pandemic. So I think perseverance and persevering through that was the best name we could have chosen. Definitely. I think they even nicknamed it Percy. That's at yeah. least what I've heard from just neighbors. To when I talked about with my, you know, local, just local people and neighbors, they're like, oh, it's Percy. I'm like, okay, I guess everybody, I, let's just say that middle school student is one of the happiest students ever, uh, you know, uh, selecting um, their name. Um, okay, so I was also wondering about something else. Um, uh, does JPL collaborate or share or brainstorm any ideas with other space missions? For example, the Japan, China, India space mission. Um, do you collaborate on a, I don't know, a, a, a yeah. monthly basis or in, do you collaborate at all and share information? Yeah, so JPL um, and NASA is a very, very collaborative um, entity agency. And I, I personally think that we are, we are really good at collaborating and letting everyone, not just other space agencies, but the public know what JPL is doing and also put the technical information in terms of conference papers and different publishing papers on talking about the details of how and the challenges we came through while designing a piece of technology or hardware. And Perseverance Rover specifically, um, we have many instruments that were built in other countries um, like Norway, um, from Spain, from France, so and other countries. So, so JPL um, Perseverance in particular collaborated, in, like very, um, very, um, very much involved in collaboration with other space agencies. And I personally um, worked with. Um, I have colleagues in France for the SuperCam since the master unit portion of that is built in France. So we have like seven a.m. meetings to accommodate for France time and things like that. So. So definitely um, a lot of collaboration with in our international partners. It's the hardest with the Pacific time, right? We have to yeah. uh, wake up super early for the rest of the world uh, right. to sort of accommodate all the other teams. Um, last question for me, and then we're gonna move on to the audience questions. Um, if you, I'm, I'm, I'm betting you might be a science fiction fan and which, let's say books or shows or even movies do you might might have inspired you to become an air, air and space engineer? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely am a huge sci-fi nerd and I, I enjoy reading a lot of sci-fi books and TV shows and movies. Um, but I used to actually read a lot of um, classic sci-fi um, books and short stories. So like H.G. Wells and John Campbell and different authors like um, Hugo Gernsback and folks like that. Um, but one of one of my favorite recent um, movies that I would say is Interstellar. <laughs> um, it, it really shows like um, not only like like the NASA technology or rockets or things exploring, but it talks about like it takes it beyond and exploring like the scientific um topics like um, black holes and wormholes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So so I think like the movie technically touches on various things that, um, that's that's very um, exciting and also um, lets people know and be aware of um, like the future, but like 
future as in like centuries from now future kind of deal. It's really cool. Definitely an exceptional movie. And I don't think if it got the accolades that it deserves, I have to say, but thank you for yeah. sharing. That's great to know. All right. All right. So we're, now we're going to switch over to our audience questions. We've got a couple of very curious people in here. Um, our first question uh, is from John, and it's uh, also kind of my fault for, for not asking. Uh, Vishnu, which neighborhood of Queens are you from? I f ah, forgot to mention. Regal Park. <laughs> Regal I grew Park. up in Regal Park. Okay. And uh, which college did you go, go to? I went to Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Okay. So John has an, another question, and it's about the protocols. If any... Um, are there any protocols to respond for if life is found uh, on Mars? What uh, what would the process be? Yeah, I mean, so there's the famous quote from Carl Sagan, like with uh, great claims comes great evidence. So even if we do have see um, like a data that indicates biosignatures or even life, um, the scientists I'm sure would be um, all around the world way heavily involved in that and making sure that um, what we see in terms of data, it's actually um, entailing a life or um, biosignatures or organic material. So should that happen or when that happen, um, definitely there'll be a lot of involvement from the science team um, before making that an official news. Okay. Uh, we've got another question from Tracy. Um, sh she was wondering, uh, if you do these kinds of uh, Q and A's and uh, informative sessions with uh, students in schools, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, John has another question. Um, with uh, what is the status of construction of the vehicle that will uh, bring humans to the sur surface of Mars, and uh, will that vehicle launch, uh, or how will the vehicle launch from uh, the surface of Mars? Yeah, so right now, <laughs> right, yeah, so there's actually a lot of um, research and R&D going into that, um, like SpaceX, um, our partner SpaceX is doing that. Um, we have um, other companies like Blue Origin and NASA and JPL are uh, working on that piece of technology. But um, to get to Mars and get humans safely, there's a lot of key technologies we need to demonstrate. Um, it varies anywhere from like astronaut suits, um, we need to ensure that um, astronauts can survive um, being on the surface of Mars because we have a lot of radiation and cosmic rays um, hitting the surface. We don't have the Earth's uh, strong magnetic sphere, sphere um, to stop that. Um, and of course, um, we need something that will generate oxygen on Mars. So MOXIE will hopefully demonstrate that for us. Um, and also um, entry, descent, and landing. So getting into Mars and landing safely is a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult uh, basically stage of the mission. So we need to make sure that we have the right technology to do that. Right now, as I mentioned, the Perseverance rover is about the um, size of an SUV. So it's not that big, So, but it's still very difficult to land that on Mars. So imagine sending multiple astronauts and all the life, um, uh, life containing equipments um, that we need. So it's gonna be very challenging for that. So we need new technology for those. And we need a lot of new fuel source, um, like Perseverance rover operates at 110 watts, but if we have humans on Mars, we need a lot more energy. So we need to determine how we're gonna tackle that. So there's a lot of key technologies we need to basically demonstrate and satisfy before safely sending humans to Mars. And John has a, a follow-up question. Uh, if uh, NASA if, is fully committed to uh, that humans who land on Mars must be able to return to Earth, or is the possibility that they would have to stay there? I personally think that um, all the mission going forward will ensure that we bring back humans safely. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know other than that. Okay. Arlene's got a question of uh, how did you learn, learn to work uh, on a team? Yeah. So, I mean, teamwork at JPL is one of the main reasons um, I personally think why we landed successfully on Mars many times. And JPL is also like the only um, agency that has successfully landed a uh, spacecraft on Mars. And, and that all comes from, I think, teamwork and being inclusive and collaborative work. 
Um, so if I go into a meeting and it's a bunch of senior um, engineers, um, if I encountered an anomaly or an issue, I had no issue speaking that up. Um, people um, treat you as if you're on the same level. So it's a very uh, horizontal um, leadership scale. So you can basically um, message or text your boss's boss or the managers and it's no problem. So it's a very inclusive environment. And uh, John has one more question of, uh, what was your biggest surprise so far? My biggest surprise, um, when we got the first uh, microphone data from um, Perseverance, uh, from Supercam specifically, um, we heard a lot of wind noise and that blew my mind. Like I didn't expect Mars to be that windy and just putting my headphones together, listening to it. Um, and, and I also became the first person to listen because on Sol Zero, when we got the data down, um, I was on console immediately downloaded and processed and listened to the microphone data. And it was just a real experience um, listening to it in stereo mode and hearing the wind noise and things like that. And that really surprised me. Wow. Uh, I've got a, another question from me. Um, considering how many cameras there are on uh, the, the rover, what is the possibility of uh, them creating a, a, an immersive uh, VR style experience of being on Mars? Yeah, that's that's actually a great point. Um, we have a lab at JPL called the Ops Lab, and they have actually been working on a piece of technology that uses um, augmented reality for planning on Mars. So we do have navigation cameras and two cameras that take stereo images on the surface. So we basically use all that stereo imagery and meshes to create a immersive world so that you can wear a VR headset and walk around Mars. And that's also, um, there's also plans for that to be used by scientists so that they can basically put that headset on, walk around different Mars and act like a geologist walking on Mars. So, so it's, it's a very cool, uh, technology that we are planning to exercise. Okay. Well, that's all of the questions that we have, uh, unless Bronca, you have any more that you'd like to bring up. There's going to be a lifetime of, of questions, but uh, I guess we're running out of time. And um, oh, at one point I kind of wanted to make um, for any potential school groups or local Queens schools or beyond Queens, uh, New York City, East Coast or anything like that. Um, would you recommend a specific website or an email uh, we should, you know, refer them to and we can post that on our website and our social media uh, just for the school teachers to get in touch with you or any of the other crew that um, basically does presentations for children. Um, if you can recommend that, that will be really good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so JPL has like a outreach website uh, where we have like contacts and things like that. Um, and also like uh, pointers to our social media, like Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. And if you, and they have contacts to different uh, PR representatives and they definitely, if you reach out to them, um, they're pretty fast at responding. And at JPL, we have engineers and scientists um, who do outreach so that they'll connect you with one of them. And the people will be more than happy to do uh, talks and outreach stuff. No, this is uh, exceptional and such a, you know, such a good and uh, fairly rare opportunity to have you here on board and, and uh, to share with uh, the rest of Queens and with the pandemic, um, however detrimental and horrible it is, we've managed to get closer in the virtual world and to get m much bigger and better access and more egalitarian access to um, information and uh, people like you. Uh, so we truly, truly appreciate your time and the efforts that you're doing. And we wanted to wish you the best of luck, but I know it's not just luck. It's, yeah. it's you know, it's science, it's engineering, it's facts, it's teamwork and hard work, if I might mention. So um, please everyone uh, um, tune in uh, whenever possible, follow the uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. I believe on Instagram, it's JP, NASA JPL. So you can always follow them there or on Twitter because I've been following and getting the news very frequently uh, whenever there's a uh, anything, any big developments going on. Um, 
please continue to do so. And I don't know, Jaren, if you want to have any more remarks, but I think at this point, yes, uh, I, uh, I hope that, uh, You'll be able to come back to Queens sometime soon and uh, come walk around your old neighborhoods. We'd love to say hi if you come by. Um, but for our virtual viewers, I want to thank all of you guys for coming out to today's program. Uh, we have more programs coming up. Uh, next week, we have our airfare program uh, the, on the 10th. And then May 1st, we're going to have our In Your Neighborhood program on the Greek Orthodox uh, Church in Astoria. Uh, I want to thank you once again, Vishnu, for uh, your uh, generous donation of your time. Um, it was absolutely fascinating, and I've already had a love for space and science, and this just helps deepen it further. Um, so yeah. thank Thanks you so, so much. much for having me. All right. So I want everybody else to have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time on uh, our